Hello, listeners. This is a sequel episode. Last time on the Subtle Forces. Totally. I read some copy on the back of a sauerkraut bottle the other day. I think it had the term primordial tang in it. And I was like, ah! Here is the label for the Brineries Sea Stag Sauerkraut. The energy of land and briny sea unite in this distinct kraut. Nutrient-dense seaweed fuses with healing burdock root and the medicinal superpowers of turmeric for a stunning flavor and rich golden color. We invite you to explore the flavors created by the simple magic of family farmed vegetables, brine, and thyme, raw, unpasteurized, and full of ancient cultures that stimulate your inner economy with a primordial tang. This time on The Subtle Forces, I am speaking with David Saturn Klingenberger, maker of the very sauerkraut I was eating, and founder of the brinery, which also makes the following creatively named sauerkrauts, Galaxy Rose, Storm Cloud Zapper, Fair and By, Sea Stag, and Stimulus Package. When I met up with David, who lives in Ann Arbor, Michigan, he was drinking from a bottle which was obviously homemade kombucha. And when he described it, I knew I was talking to the author of Primordial Tang because his description of the kombucha itself was like a tantalizing advertisement. Ooh. And it's my favorite one. It, it tastes like bubblicious grape soda. It's so good. It tastes like bubblicious grape soda. It's so good. It's so good. Do you have a story of how sauerkraut saved your life? Or do you have just the general story of how the brinery came about? Ooh. Well, I guess they're both kind of similar stories, like many people, I've always searched for meaningful work and life. It's all intertwined. I was a farmer, an organic vegetable farmer for many years, and I made my first sauerkraut while first farming and just getting into anything food preservation related. And at an early age, in my early 20s, of all the methods of food preservation, it had the most magic to it. The alchemy of turning cabbage to sauerkraut feels magical. All the bacterial bubbling life forces, um, it just, it was so cool to me. Like I was making jam and dehydrating food and freezing food, but like fermentation to me was just like, what a cool alchemy to be shepherding bacteria and just interacting in this really magical way always rooted in science, but there is magic to it. And I think that's what really got me into it was as a very young man, I'm, I'm 42 now. And in my early twenties, I fell in love with feeding people in my community on a local farm. And that's when I first made sauerkraut. And then fast forward to over 10 years later, when I started the brinery, the same farm where I had first made sauerkraut had a bumper crop of cabbage. And I said, oh, I'm looking for also a way to channel my angst or my whatever childhood trauma things, or just my passions, whatever it is, my intensity into something. I needed to like really go all in on something. And I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So I made Kraut and then here we are now. I love that you are a shepherder of bacteria. And that's the thing with the sauerkraut production, it's a, a wild fermentation. So we're not adding any lab grown or cultivated single celled organisms, like a lot of like cheese making and beer and wine. There's like specific strains of yeast and such that have been developed. The sauerkraut uh, is, is a wild bacteria. And so we're just shepherding and creating the right environment for them to proliferate. And every barrel of sauerkraut we make is like its own solar system of bacteria 
Do you feel like cheese makers have a little more of like that scientist personality where like they are trying to get a precise thing, whereas like maybe sauerkraut makers are a little more of like the uh, go with the flow types? I really like that you're going with that. I think I would say yes. I'd say like the difference would be between being like a chef and a baker like baking is mm. so precise with the ratios and you'll you'll see the margins between like failure and success can be so affected by the exact measurements um whereas with sauerkraut making there is a flexibility like the temperature range is flexible the wild fermentation there's like this rigorous like natural occurrence so i yes i would say I am myself, I'm not very scientific minded. And I came at sauerkraut making more of like the cultural, his, like farmer food preservation context. And and I, I think if I had picked something more scientifically necessary, like cheese making at the beginning, I think I probably wouldn't have been as successful. I will say we're also making a lot of tempeh. Are you familiar with tempeh? It's like a fermented tofu type thing. Well, that's a great description. That one is the closest to making like a cheese or something. And that needs such specific requirements. And we have to introduce a mold culture that originated from Indonesia. So that tests all of our ability to be scientific minded because it's such a finicky thing. So we, it, within the brinery, most of what we do is sauerkraut, which is much more forgiving, but then we do make tempeh, which is closer to like making cheese. But like tempeh is, I would call tempeh like the charcuterie of the non-meat world because it's like mold cultured beans and it's it's a a mushroom garden in a bed of beans. Wow. Is that on the package for tempeh? No, but it should be. Um, I want to give credit. I think that was a Quebec tempeh company who called it that. Okay. Um, but <laughs> It, it sounds better than moldy bean loaf. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this depends on what mood you're in. Exactly. Sometimes when I want to like be a little edgy, I do remind people that it's a moldy bean loaf. But it's funny because like mainstream, very like, well, I don't know what to call them, like mainstream vanilla. American normies. Normies. They'll like be so weirded out by kimchi or, or tempeh or funky ferments that we make, but then they'll eat a big bowl of like blue cheese dressed salad and blue cheese is like so funky <laughs> yeah. so and that's the cool thing with fermentation is that like just like everything in life is on a spectrum like color sexuality health every everything is on a spectrum even with fermentation there's no like we're all looking for these hard and fast rules to live by but like one man's like rotten vegetables is another man's like prized culinary delight and the, like the Chinese they have some of the most amazing what I would call pushing the boundaries of palatability like I could define for myself what I would consider rotten and what I would consider a fermented delicacy but that would change for somebody else I think it also has to do with developing a palate for it of course because I I remember when I got into kimchi for the first time as someone in college my roommate Monina prepared kimchi with some rice and some duck eggs and it was like the most delicious meal of my life and then the very next day Monina wasn't around so I decided to repeat the exact meal and I got to bite number two and I wanted to vomit and I was like what happened I don't know what happened you do you, do you not know what happened I think my palate just it was still adjusting it I don't know if maybe eating it in the company of Monina made it delicious whereas eating it alone sad by myself <laughs> like made it taste bad but like I, I love kimchi now but like uh -huh. um I do think kimchi is the sort of thing that like on the wrong day it might not taste as good I agree and my employees will say that too like opening up a barrel of kimchi like at 7 a.m in the morning and it's like hits you full in the face like a 55 gallon barrel and you're like bend over and it's like it's intense and it'll like make your eyes water and it's like not something that you might be want to be interfacing to, to that extreme level so i think there's something to that even the time of day and but some of these things too like kimchi there's so much stronger like there's garlic and onions in there which are already so aromatic and pungent that like 
they can like amplify some of that umami, but also that intensity if if you're just not feeling it on that day. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So tell me about how the copy for your products came about. That is like the fun stuff. Um, And so like, I think the copy that you've read on our labels, we've done different iterations and throughout the years, a few years ago, we had like an old label that we'd used at least seven years and we wanted to like update the label. And that's when I think we went back and doubled down on really putting effort into the copy that you were reading on the label. And we were working with my friend who did the label redesign And then he brought in an actual professional copywriter and she actually, that was the only time I've ever worked with somebody like that. And so we would like give her the information she would write a copy and we would like give our notes on it and stuff. So we, it was a really, it was fun. That was like the only time, everything else I've done throughout the years has just been myself with friends or in-house people. And we're just kind of like making stuff up, but we did use a professional copy person for this information that you see on the label. It, it reads smart. Like it has a little bit of marketing speak, but it's tasteful. It's, it's literary. Yeah. And I, I love collaborating with professionals like that. It met our needs. And, and I think we, we constantly had to like get her to infuse our authentic, you know, playfulness. But I think if I was left to my own devices, you would be able to tell because there would be too many exclamation points and like too much, too much wackiness, I think. I just want to know who came up. I don't even know if you remember this, but who came up with the term primordial tang? I think it was one of those cool things. I, I'm going to assume just because like I am I'm interested in like writing and like you know like people who make tv shows or movies and like that collaboration of a writer's room I think I can't actually remember who came up with it but it came out of the collaborative process of multiple people um I'll just take credit for it okay is that all right it was all me (laughs) but it might I I cannot honestly remember it might have been Ellie who used to work for me who came up with it Um, it might've been the copywriter, but I remember the process. I remember we wanted to capture like the funkiness and like the ancientness of bacteria and alchemy. And like, I would totally give credit if I remembered specifically who it was, it was either, it was like one of four people, but it was during a very collaborative process. Well, I was discussing primordial tang with another copywriter and he was just like, because because I I bet bet you that the 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 primordial primordial tang person person is working, working on a novel right now. Like, like to me, me that, that sounds that, that sounds, sounds literary, literary primordial, primordial tang. <laughs> <laughs> what flavors of sauerkraut get the most buzz and why? Probably the biggest one is what we call fair and by, which is the plain cabbage. And I think it gets the most sales just because it's it's like the most traditional. But Some of the other ones, like the sea stag, which is the really very non-traditional, gets a lot of buzz and we sell a lot of it. And I think it's because it's so unique. The ingredients of sea stag sauerkraut, green cabbage, carrots, burdock root, seaweed, digitata, alaria, kelp, turmeric, filtered water, Sea salt. This is the sauerkraut I bought because I want the odd one. Yeah, we have like maybe wrote, we have like four core krauts, which we sell year round. And then we'll have like another eight seasonal products and small batch products that will rotate through throughout the year. One funny thing on copy, uh, the name Fair and Buy, um, that's our flagship kraut. It's plain kraut. Actually the term Fair and Buy, I came up with, I used to sail as well on traditional wooden schooners. And I was misremembering the term. There's a term in sailing. I'll always remember when I was new to sailing and my captain was like, grab the helm. And I was like, ah. and I was like, what course should I steer? And he was like, and I remembered it as a uh, fair and by the wind, but it's actually the proper term is full, full and by the wind. So it means keep your sails full and point the boat as high up into the direction of the wind as possible. But I remembered it, it as fair and by. So I named the sauerkraut fair and by, but the actual sailing term is 
full and by the wind. And poetically, that makes sense with your idea of shepherding the bacteria, of like aiming it for the proper conditions for the inner economy to flourish. What is the essence of inner economy? So that was fun too. At the very beginning, I started the brinery in like the end of 2009, early 2010. And we were just coming out of this, a big recession. And there was like, a you know, the stimulus package. It was like stimulus money. And so very early on, I thought it would be funny to like, make every one of our our sauerkrauts have a different like economic term so we have a sauerkraut called stimulus package i Uh, noticed that yeah but but i think very quickly i like lost interest because i'm more into like mystical magical stuff and so the only economic thing we named was stimulus package but the the, still the tagline for the brinery is stimulating your inner economy and so to me I feel like I'm using economy and like ecosystem or an ecology kind of interchangeable. Like these are ecosystems. Like the economy is like made up of so many things in the real world and ecosystem is made up of all these different organisms and stuff. So I loved the idea of stimulating your inner economy with the stimulus package, which is fermented foods. I love when people twist bureaucracy into into something yeah. else. I love that. And so the other names that I never went with was going to be like hedge fund. And really quickly, we went into like more fun stuff like Sea Stag and yeah. Galaxy Rose. Like those just are more fun. Yeah. For I, I, and, and I think they're much more sellable. Yeah. So yeah. this... This one, I think you, cause you are like interested in like the, the copy and like the history of the names. This to me, I think is my, is my favorite along with, um, as far as like the naming of the products, um, this one too, I think these are my two favorite named products. Is it reversed? Can you, can you read these or is it like flipped? Well, uh, oh yeah. Storm cloud zapper. Yes. Have you heard of that one? No. So that one is is my I think all time favorite name. Um, the name alone is like a poem. It's like a complete sentence. And the history of that is a friend of mine, um, and I'm kind of a, a hippie, or I don't know what even that means. But some friends of mine were very lovingly had a, a term that they would call real hippies. Like there's one guy in particular who was so spaced out hippie that they lovingly referred to him as a cloud zapper. Oh. And it's such a, and they made it up, but I think it comes from this like esoteric German scientist who was trying to like zap the clouds to get all the energy, almost kind of like Tesla's type stuff. And they were like, man, that guy is a cloud zapper. And so when I was starting the brinery, I was like, I just love that term cloud zapper. Like somebody's just zapping the clouds, like, woo. And so that's where the term uh, storm cloud zapper came from. A lovingly kind of playful, but poking fun at ultra hippies. Those are my favorite people. Like I still sell at the Ann Arbor farmer's market where I first started, even though now we're in like around 700 stores, but like my favorite shoppers are those like silver haired, elegant aging hippies who are just like gracefully, like elegantly walking to the market with their woven basket. Those are some (laughs) of my core customers at the market. (laughs) And now some words about David's favorite sauerkraut at the brinery, Galaxy Rose Sauerkraut. This one is my personal, I would call this my spirit kraut. This one I think represents how things developed at the brinery. Um, Everything from the actual sauerkraut to the naming of it. This was directly inspired by Carl Sagan. Are you familiar Mm. with Carl Sagan? He's a physicist. Yes. And, you know, did that famous show, The Cosmos, and was just very much an, as an astronomer and a physicist, but was so good at communicating with lay people. Um, it's just, Carl Sagan is a, is a hero of mine. Some creative genius on YouTube remixed footage from Carl Sagan's show called Cosmos and auto-tuned it and made a banger of a track. It should be played in clubs, it's so good. I'm not very good at uh, singing songs, but uh, here's here's a try. Carl 
Carl Sagan has a quote and they made a song out of it, which is auto-tuned and awesome. But he says, a still more glorious dawn awaits, not a sunrise, but a galaxy rise, 10 billion stars, the rising of the Milky Way. A still more glorious dawn awaits, not a sunrise, but a galaxy rise, a morning filled with 400 billion suns, the rising of the Milky Way. And so I just love that because also, I think about the billions of bacteria that are in each one of these cells, like each one is like a little sun and like we, we are like the galaxy and it's like everything is a vessel, like, you know, our body is a vessel, this jar is a vessel and we're all just like traveling through space and time. But uh, I love the idea of when we see the sunrise, it's one sun, but when you see the stars come out at night, you're looking at like 10 billion plus stars, you're watching like the rising of of a, of a galaxy. And so coming back to galaxy rose. So we were like, my farmer friend had an abundance of watermelon radish. Are you familiar with watermelon radish? Is it pink? Yes. Yeah. That's where the color comes from. Um, it's just a beautiful, beautiful heirloom radish that has this beautiful color. And so he had this bumper crop of this beautiful radish. And so we were like very creative, wanting to like use local produce that was abundant. And so we started making sauerkraut with it and we loved the color. And then we were just like on the production floor in the very early days of the brinery. And we were like, and I kept playing that Carl Sagan song. The sky calls to us. If we do not destroy ourselves, we will one day venture to the stars. I was just so like obsessed with it and I would play it for everyone all the time and it was just like part of the fabric of the day and it was just like this galaxy's rising and as we we're making this and like packaging it I was playing that song and then we were just kind of spitballing together and then um one of my employees was like galaxy rose and we were all like yes that's it this is the galaxy rose because it's also the color of a rose and it's like you know, galaxy has risen and it's like the galaxy rose, the galaxy rose. So it was like this kind of, yeah, that make, <laughs> does that make sense? I hope so. It, it's a really good sauerkraut. And I think just the color is beautiful. The radish isn't too intense. It just has, it has like a really pure sauerkraut flavor, but I just, the color, I just love natural colors. The rising of the Milky Way. A still more glorious dawn awaits, not a sunrise, but a galaxy rose, a morning filled with hundred billion suns, the rising of the Milky Way. The surface of the Earth is the shore of the cosmic ocean. Recently we've waned a little way up, and the water seems inviting. It's special. And then the other, the sea stag sauerkraut was really inspired because we put a, a seaweed that's uh, wild harvested off the coast of Maine. And so that's what inspired calling it sea stag. I came up with that name um, and I thought it was like all in my own head. I had created it. And then after I named that seaweed sea stag, I was doing Google searches and then I found other references to the sea stag. And there's this really obscure mystical creature called a sea stag. And then there's artists who have like done paintings of sea stags. And I found this amazing artist in Australia who had separately got really into sea stags and had done these paintings of the sea stag. Wow. It was almost as if the mythological being wanted to exist to you. Yes, it did. And, and then I hired a local artist to paint a sea stag and we actually have brinery uh, t-shirts with the sea stag. Oh, what yeah. do you think you have learned from the mythical creature of the sea stag? I think with myself and my own like mental health and all that like I gotta like be in that oceanic flow but also rooted in on in the firmament of of like reality and the land so for me there's like mental metaphorical thing of like the land and the sea but I also just love like you know like the vegetables grown on land but then like the actual seaweed that's in there and seaweed is so important and amazing because it has all these trace minerals but it's because they have all these trace minerals because all of the I mean the earth itself we are on an ancient star 
like all that hot magma inside, like all of the upwelling that comes from within the core of the earth is the earth itself at the center is full of stardust from the galaxy. And then we have like volcanic eruptions and mountain ranges over billions of years come up. And then through erosion, all of that mineral stardust, minerals are stardust, erodes into the ocean. And then that's why the ocean is so salty and full of minerals because it's all of that, like it's the lowest place on the earth. So all of that stardust goes back into the ocean and then it's in the seaweed. Beautiful. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Yeah. <laughs> so that's what we're trying to capture with like some of our copy, but like what I, that's when, and that's why I love Carl Sagan. Cause it's like, there's so much real science to it, but then it's like, it's so magical. It's like, I love it. Like, I love that like fairies, gnomes, elves, like, do they exist? Probably not. But what exists are single celled organisms that are magical, that are like con converting cabbage to sauerkraut. And it's like, to me, it's like the single cell bacteria are like the little fairies and the elves and the gnome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree. I'd also say though, that there's a lot to the collective unconscious imagination that we don't even understand. And the fact that you found the sea stag or the sea stag found you is like pure unconscious collective magic. Mm. Yeah. That's, that's a good reason. That's a good, I, yeah, you're right. Because other people separate of me were like finding the sea stag themselves. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Thank you to Brad Roy from last week's episode for suggesting that I try and find the source of the primordial tang. Thank you to the source of the primordial tang, David Saturn Klingenberger and the Brinery. Thank you to YouTube star Melody Sheep for allowing me, a humble citizen non-god, for being able to use your track, A Glorious Dawn, in this podcast. And thank you to my brother Anton for creating the Subtle Forces theme music you're listening to right now. Thank you to Bacteria, Microcosms, Carl Sagan, The Big Bang, and The Sea Stag for making this episode possible. If you're over on Apple Podcasts, write a review. And remember, when encountering any subtle force, you have both your logic and your feelers. It tastes like bubblicious grape soda. It's so good. It's so good.